one other the one other thing I want to say by way of introduction, which is kind of a um, going to take a few minutes to develop, but which is a really important theme in some ways, the theme of this whole lecture is this phrase, which you may have encountered before: "There is no such thing as natural as a natural disaster." Very, calling these developments and crises and struggles natural disasters already basically externalizes the real issues at stake, the causes and the consequences. This is a book that was edited, published after Hurricane Katrina by Chester Hartman and Gregory Squires. And what I want to focus on is an article that I actually should have assigned for the session. And it's easy to find if anybody wants to read it after the class today by the great critical geographer, um, Neil Smith, um, who passed away tragically um, some years ago but a brilliant figure in critical radical geography, somebody I got to work with a little bit during my New York City days and who we, we miss in the field of critical urban studies because he was a brilliant, fiery critic and in brilliant, insightful scholar. But he wrote a piece after um, Katrina, 2006. If you just Google Neil Smith, there's no such thing as a natural disaster. You'll find it. I encourage you to read it. And I just want to quickly summarize what Neil Smith argued which is incredibly relevant for understanding the other meetings for today. So this is his summary of the, the, the proposition of what it means that there's no such thing as natural disaster. He says, it's generally accepted among environmental geographers that there is no such thing as a natural disaster. In every phase and aspect of disaster, Neil Smith wrote, causes vulnerability, preparedness, results in response and reconstruction, the contours of disaster and difference between who lives and who dies is to a greater or lesser extent a social calculus, fundamental. So the causes, the vulnerability, preparedness, results in response, reconstruction, it's a social calculus. And the challenge for us as critical social scientists trying to make sense of urban ecological emergencies, environmental emergencies, is to understand that social calculus. That's the core point. In some ways, we, we're going to weave that thread through all the readings of the day. What is the social calculus? Who suffers? Who suffers worst? Who suffers most brutally? That's the problematique that Neil Smith very brilliantly, crisply formulated in this piece. And let me just unpack it in a couple more steps. Again, I encourage you strongly to read this essay. First of all, in terms of causes, Smith recognizes that natural processes and events of nature exist. But he's suggesting, first of all, that they're mediated through social processes, power relations, and inequality. So climate change itself, we know, is induced through, you know, the last, among other things, the last 150 years of fossil capital, maybe a bit longer than 150 years. And that has generated a um, release of greenhouse gases, which has contributed to global warming and sea level rise. So among other, among other aspects of climate change, and so that itself is already a social process mediated through unequal power relations, forms of class exploitation, racialized uh, labor uh, exploitation, genocide, and so forth. So um, the very causes of natural disasters have to be also understood as mediated through social, economic, political structures and processes. Vulnerability, I mean, a classic topic, a key topic in the, the policy-oriented literature, quite appropriately so, highly differentiated vulnerability. And we know this very well in the context of COVID, but it applies to pretty much any other putative national na natural disaster, be it an earthquake, a tsunami, a flood, a, um, a fire. Some people are more vulnerable than others. The question is who, how, who, and why, by what institutional mechanisms is that vulnerability engendered? So the class and race gradients of risk and vulnerability are a key um, focal point and puzzle for sociologists of disaster. And by the way, let me just pause for a moment. The noise is going on a little longer and louder than I expected. Is this still viable for you guys? I'm talking a little bit louder than usual. Is it, is it problematic or it's okay? I see hands are up. Okay, so maybe it's worse for me. I really apologize. This situation in my home workspace should uh, should be over, but unfortunately it continues and it keeps continuing precisely at the moment when I would really appreciate a little more um, tranquility. But it's okay, if it's really distracting anybody, tell me and I can do something about it. Okay, thank you very much. 
Okay, so vulnerability is unevenly distributed. Um, again, the social calculus that Smith alluded to in the quote from a few slides ago, he's now unpacking as class and race gradients of risk and vulnerability. That's the puzzle. How do we understand the class and race risk gradients of vulnerability? There's, they're mediated obviously through, you know, maybe a biogeophysical process, but they're socially and institutionally and politically engendered. And then governance and preparedness, another layer of this program antique. Political institutions and governance arrangements directly mediate and shape the impact of disasters and their unevenly distributed consequences. So existing systems of social support, housing, healthcare, communication, infrastructures of emergency management and disaster response. Again, Hurricane Katrina is a classic example, but we could give other examples from you know, Texas, from Dallas or Houston right now, where existing structures of social support, if you're already vulnerable or you're already um, unhoused or inadequately housed, and an event like this happens, you're much more vulnerable to um, extremely um, dangerous, if not life-threatening consequences of the disaster. Um, if you're not, if you, you know, some people prior to Katrina or other imminent natu natural disasters might have the means to relocate elsewhere. Like in South Florida, if uh, you know, there's lots of hurricanes that roll in every fall. So some people have the means to basically get out, get out of town, but most people don't. So, so that, you know, lots of other examples could be given in terms of where you live, how you live, what your employment situation is like, whether you have extra money in the bank account to deal with an emergency, whether you have health care, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those elements, Smith is arguing, I very much agree, are mediated through class and racial gradients of inequality. So that, and then also Smith emphasizes the distinction between the event itself and the aftermath. Surviving the event is one thing, but as we also know from painful, brutal historic, historical experience, Sometimes the slow violence, to use Rob Nixon's phrase, that occurs in the aftermath of the disaster is even more devastating. So the disaster is not simply a punctual event, but it can be like a long-term process and often is a long-term process in which the social inequalities um, that pre-existed the, the, the event itself um, generate or um, become this, yeah, they basically generate and mediate even greater forms of social suffering and inequality, again, depending on the ways in which governmental institutions and other uh, public uh, agencies manage that particular situation. And again, whether we're talking about a fire, an earthquake, a tsunami, a flood, a hurricane, a heat wave, these general propositions that Smith laid out in 2006, I think are pretty useful. So I'll just quote him um, just one last time. He says, not just the market, but successive administrations from the federal to the urban scale made the poorest population of New Orleans vulnerable. He's talking about Hurricane Katrina. Since 2001, knowing that a catastrophic hurricane was likely and would in all probability devastate New Orleans, the Bush administration nonetheless opened hundreds of square miles of wetland to development on the grounds that the market knows best. And in the process eroded New Orleans natural protection. So precisely the wetlands that would have, if left protected um, from development, would have actually buffered the effect of Hurricane Katrina, they were, um, they were developed. So um, anyway, he continues basically with this um, argument. He says, given the stunned amazement with which people around the world greeted images of a stranded African-American populace in the deadly sewage pond of post-Katrina New Orleans, it's difficult not to agree, to agree with Illinois Senator, then he was a Senator, Barack Obama, the people of New Orleans weren't just abandoned during the hurricane, they were abandoned long ago. So Obama certainly had it right. Um, as Smith then continues to argue, the uh, reconstruction and repair is also another social class and racial gradient. Disaster reconstruction invariably cuts deeper the ruts and grooves of social oppression and exploitation. Again, a very crisp formulation from Neil Smith that it, the, it cuts deeper. The, think about that metaphor. So the ruts and grooves of social oppression and exploitation, they pre-exist the disaster. 
But what the disaster often does is it cuts those ruts and grooves deeper and exacerbates them. Maybe it forms new ruts and grooves, but it's, it's, it kind of rolls through and cuts deeper the grooves that were already there. And Smith's argument, again, I very much agree, is that um, to the degree that market disciplinary approaches are used in a post-disaster context, in other words, privatization, liberalization, let private firms do it, that's often likely to further intensify and deepen those ruts and grooves of social oppression. The alternative scenario that Smith and many of us are also interested in is the ways in which sometimes disasters, crises, and emergencies, they open up new horizons for democratic management and collective self, uh, collective provisioning, collective uh, mutual aid. And that tension between kind of the privatized market-driven strategy and the emergence of collective uh, and mutual aid scenarios is um, precisely the politics, the social politics of disaster at an urban scale and at other scales as well. And I just want to share with you one more thing by way of intro to the day, to the issues here. Some of you will be familiar with Naomi Klein's book, um, Shock Doctrine. And basically she's arguing exactly this latter point that, that under conditions of neoliberalism, a kind of market fundamentalist approach to societal um, governance, in, the, in, in a moment of disaster, a kind of whether it's a, a military crisis or an environmental crisis, there's often a rush to kind of dismantle social protections and bring in corporate solutions, in quotation marks, to the issues. So by privatizing different, um, different institutions that provide collective goods. And Naomi Klein actually uses um, post-Katrina New Orleans as well as post- um, you know, post-war, post-U.S. invasion, post-second U.S. invasion of Iraq as examples of this, of a kind of moment of social crisis and disorientation, and that's used by the forces of kind of neoliberal corporate capitalism as a way to seize power and roll out um, market-based um, approaches to um, societal governance. And in contrast to that, this very interesting book by Rebecca Solnit, whose work I mentioned last time on, um, on New York City, of what she does in that book. I don't know if anyone has seen it, but I highly recommend it. She looks at the ways in which it's this idea of a paradise built in hell, precisely in moments of deep societal crisis and emergency, networks of mutual aid form and actually point towards, she argues, a completely different form of society. So it's precisely this contradiction, the disaster as a moment to increase private corporate control and marketized forms of coordination versus the counter vision, the counterpoint of Klein and of Solnit and others, also of Neil Smith, of uh, the disaster actually opens up a space in which people recognize, well, a lot of different things, their common humanity, the, um, the impulse to help one's fellow human being and alleviate suffering and sacrifice for the, for the collective good. So some pretty basic values that in many ways are at odds with a kind of market disciplinary, market fundamentalist um, approach. So I want you to keep that contrast in mind between the kind of market driven or market disciplinary uh, reaction to a disaster and the more solidaristic mutual aid oriented approach.